Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Lisa Schmucky. I'm the founder of EdWeb, and it's my honor to be able to introduce today's presentation, which is going to be an interview presented by the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation with Herschel Williams, who's a recipient of the Medal of Honor. And we're delighted that we can bring these interviews to teachers and students all around the country and the world so you can hear about the experiences that led to um, awarding recipient Herschel Williams, the Medal of Honor, but even more importantly, the reflections on life going back and going forward that really can resonate with the challenges that students face in their own lives um, that call upon them for courage and sacrifice. So um, we're really, really delighted to have this presentation today. And the interview is going to be uh, conducted by Kathy Metcalf, who's the Vice President of Education with the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation. But before we begin, we just want to take a poll and learn a little bit more about our audience and who's joining us today, because I know that classrooms are coming from all around the country with their students. So if the team would pull up the poll. Great. So you can click on the circle there next to the level of education that you may be joining from um, with your, if you're a teacher attending with your class. So um, we'll just give this a few minutes to see what the results are. We know we have people from all levels of education. It looks like it's a little bit more high school. Um, and some other too. So if you selected other, please post in the chat and tell us um, homeschooling, that's wonderful. And hello from everywhere in the world where you're from, California, Virginia, Tennessee, New York. This is a great way for us all to be together and also be joined by a classroom as well um, for this presentation. So I'm gonna close the poll. And Kathy, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you and Medal of Honor recipient Herschel Williams and sit back and, and, and listen. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, teachers and students and other viewers. It's a privilege to be here today. I'm honored to be here with Herschel Williams, who is a veteran from World War II, wears the Medal of Honor. And I wasn't paying attention. You're not wearing your Medal of Honor. I have it in my pocket. Oh well, we'd love to see it. <laughs> All right. um, I, I should have I should have done that. But we are coming for, to you today on a very very special day from a very special place. We are here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. And this museum started out as the National D-Day Museum and is now recognized uh, nation and worldwide as one of the premier um, institutions for keeping World War II history in, in, in the entire world. Woody was uh, part of that a very long time ago and in fact today is celebrating his 95th birthday. So great opportunity for us to um, recognize you on your birthday and just to celebrate that you're still hanging around with us. Well thank you. Good job and doing it well too. <laughs> showing us that this is a goal right here. This You're all looking at a goal. And I also want to recognize students at Caneland High School in the greater Chicago area. Students, you want to say hello? They have been kind enough to let us see their faces today. It's always more fun. Uh, we appreciate all you who are logged on and we're watching the chats that you put, uh, that you type in, but we can't see all your faces. Caneland is presenting a face for you today. So thank you, everybody. Teachers and students, this webinar is mainly for you. That's what we're here for, to give you an opportunity to chat with students, Woody, and for students to ask questions. We like to use these webinars to build the primary resource material that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask you a few questions to, okay. so we can get acquainted. And then we'll take student questions and teacher questions. And just so you know, if the others of you who write in, we always try to take student and teacher questions first. Um, okay, so to get started, happy 95th birthday. You grew up a very distant time from where the time that our children today are growing up. Both our young children, we have some elementary students. I saw a group from Kentucky and I think El Cajon, California. So. Um, they're up in a different time. 
and even our high school students. Can you tell us a little bit what it was like growing up when you were a young man, a student in school? Sure, yes. Well, first of all, let me say my theme for today, it's great to be alive at 95. All right. So that's my theme for the day. This is an <clears throat> the Medal of Honor. Let me explain the fact that there are three of these. Each branch of the service, major branches of the service, have a Medal of Honor. We have one for the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, and that's this medal. And then there is a medal for the Army, which is different, and then a larger medal for the Air Force. They had to make one bigger because uh, big airplanes. <laughs> I grew up in the country, so my life was a little different, of course, than those who were growing up in a city. Mm -hmm. Not a great deal, because even in the cities in my day, we had no grocery stores or markets that we could go to to get uh, stuff like butter and milk and stuff like that because we had no air conditioning. So it was one of those things that had to be done almost daily. And I grew up on a dairy farm, and we were the suppliers of milk and butter and eggs and vegetables to the people in town. So we would every morning, seven days a week, we would take milk and produce to the families in the city. And we would deliver it to their homes. And uh, they would order whatever they needed for whatever occasion they were having. Like at Christmas time or holiday time, they would order a lot more stuff than they would just naturally for everyday use. Because they're having relatives come in and they're going to have a big gathering of, of family. So they needed a whole lot more stuff. So holidays were really very busy for us. But uh, every uh, day we had to do that. We had to deliver their milk. And the milk in those days didn't come in a carton like it does today. It came in a milk bottle, a glass milk bottle. And they could, uh, once the bottle was empty, they would clean the bottle. Then we would pick it up, bring it home, and we would run it through a boiling process so that it would be clean, and then refill it and deliver it the next day back to them again. So the bottle could be done, used many, many times over. Now, how old were you when you started working? You say we, so I presume it was family business. How old were you when you started working the family business with this? Right. Okay. Uh, when my father started the farm, I was three years old. But when I reached my sixth year of age, then I became actually part of the farm operation. So each one of us had a duty assigned to us as to what we were to do to help out on the farm. And as you got older, you assumed more duties. And the uh, milk that we used uh, and actually came from cows just like it does today but today it's extracted machine wise well in our day we couldn't do that because we didn't have the machines to do it we did it by hand and uh, each person in the family and there were five of five of us in the family four boys and a girl and each one of us had an assignment of how many cows we were responsible for. Wow. Yeah. And so the older you got, the more cows you got that you had milk every day, twice a day, uh, to supply the people in town. Now, when you started going to school, did you have to get up and do this to school? Absolutely. And then did you have to do it again when you got home from school? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And the cows didn't take Saturday and Sunday off, did they? No, they didn't. 
Okay. So at what point were you in your life when World War II broke out and what prompted you to go join the service? Well, at my 16th birthday, the uh, government had started a program called Civilian Conservation Corps. And really it was to offer the youth of America, those who wanted to volunteer and to join a youth program and learn some kind of a trade, something that they could use and do once they got out of the uh, uh, CCCs, we called it. Mm -hmm. My brother next to me, he went first. Uh, he, he enlisted into it and you, you had a one-year contract. You signed it for a year. If you didn't want to stay after a year, then you come home. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they were paying money to those students or workers in the CCC. And when we started, it was $21 a month. And that was a lot of money to us because we didn't have any money. Right. And that was an effort to a good effort to help break us out of the Great Depression because exactly. so many people had no jobs at all. And right. the farms were really keeping us going at that point. True. So, so when I went in, <clears throat> I thought I would stay right in my home state of West Virginia, that I wouldn't go anywhere else. But I ended up in the state of Montana. And I was in Montana when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Okay. Right. And time they were going to discontinue the Civilian Conservation Corps because they needed these same youth that were in those in that unit mm -hmm. to go into the military right. so we could win the war mm -hmm. yeah so i instead of going straight in which i could have gone into the army i didn't want to do that i wanted to be a marine so i came home and joined the marine corps and uh did you get in right away no <laughs> uh, i wanted to go i was only 17 hadn't reached my 18th birthday yet uh, and didn't you have to be 21 at the time to join? Or no. They already lowered the age. Uh, 18. A 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. If you were under 18, you had to have a parent consent. Right. Uh, my father was deceased, and my mother said no. And my mom said no, you didn't argue. Mm -hmm. Period. <laughs> but when I was 18, I reached my 18th birthday, one month after that, I wanted to go to war. I didn't want to go to war to fight a war. I wanted to go to war to protect my country and my freedom. I didn't realize as at that age and with no more knowledge that we had in the way of worldly things, I didn't know that I would have to go someplace else, another country or another area and fight in a war. I didn't know that. So my concept at the time of going in was, all of us, not just me, but all the rest of us who were going in, would stay right here in the United States so that we could protect our country and our freedom, so that nobody could take that away from us. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, when I got to Marine Corps, I learned that the war is over there and not, thank goodness, not yes. here. Thank goodness here, but it meant you were going somewhere. That's right. Yes. Okay. So I think at this point, we probably are at a spot where we can take some questions from Caneland because I know that they had had some questions regarding things that were going on during World War II. So if I could have a student from Caneland offer a question. Okay. So my question is, after seeing the outcome that previous men with flamethrowers faced, what gave you the courage to pick one up and charge into enemy lines? Before you answer this, I'll repeat the question, but um, I, I missed some background here. I'm hoping all our viewers that you have had a chance to preview Woody's Living History. It's on www.themedalofhonor.com. And also if you Google Herschel Williams, you will find that there are uh, a lot of different interviews that you have conducted previously with the VFW and the VA and such. So there are many stories of him relating what happened in Iwo Jima and the action for which he was awarded the medal. And this question refers to that, the weapon that that uh, you carried was a flamethrower. And she was asking if, and correct me please if I got this wrong, if, if you 
would would you repeat your question so I can? Um, so I said, after seeing the outcome that previous men with flamethrowers faced, what gave you the courage to pick one up and charge into enemy lines? So this young lady's done her homework and knows that you had lost the six other people in your unit who were carried the, the weapon as the flamethrower. What gave you the courage to still pick one up and go on? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure that it's, that it is courage. I know that that's essential to whatever you do when you're in a situation like that. But that was the thing that I was trained for. Marine Corps had spent many, many hours training me to do a particular task. That was my job. So I gave it no thought whatsoever as to what I'm getting into or what may or may not happen. That's what I was trained to do. And I had taken on that responsibility, that obligation. So it was just go do it. Like anybody would go do their job, uh, whatever it may be. And the circumstances be gone. So I gave it no thought. It was just part of the job. Part of the job. Thank you. I, I hear that. And if we can have another question from Kaylin as well, we'll follow up. Um, I, I hear that many times from Medal of Honor recipients that in regards to the, the action that resulted in the Medal of Honor, that you felt you were just doing your job, doing what needed to be done in the circumstances. That's so, right. Thank you. May, another question, please? Yeah. Um, how has the combination of your work with the VA and your war experience shaped your views on the way America treats our veterans? Little, oh, so you're asking about his work with the VA and how thoughts about veterans. I think we're going back a little ways um, or maybe jumping ahead in our discussion. So we may circle back to your question. Is, is, so again, this class has done their homework and I guess they know that you worked as a veterans service mm -hmm. Service officer. Service officer. Service yeah. officer. Yeah. And so you did that. But how long ago has it been since you did that? How long? When did you retire from that? <laughs> well, I retired in 1959. So I retired a long time ago. <clears throat> so but I very well remember getting the phone call uh, at home when by somebody I'd never heard tell of who worked for the Veterans Administration, we called it then. And they said, if you would like to have a job and you would come to our place, which was 230 miles away, and I didn't have a car, and I had just married, and, uh, but if you would like to come to our place, we will give you a job and train you to be a veterans counselor. And I said, oh, I don't think I want to do that. And they said, well, the... The payment is, or the pay is pretty good. It pays $2,980 a year. I want that to soak in. Yeah. $2,980 a year. And I said, well, I'm coming. Because <laughs> I had never seen that much money. And I'd never, certainly had no plan of ever receiving that money from working. So, uh, so that was when you left the Marine Corps and went to work for the VA. No, I'd already out of the You're Marine Corps at that time. I, okay. Yeah, I was just civilian. So in, then to follow up on that question, you spent years working with veterans and counseling them about their opportunities. Um, what do you think about the way we're, we're dealing with veterans now? Do you have well, it's, it's amazing. It really is a wonderful, wonderful thing that we're doing today. When I came home, and this was true in most states. Most states only had one VA, we called it VA or Veterans Administration, facility in the state. And it generally was a hospital so that veterans who needed medical care would have someplace to go. But as I said, it was 230 miles from my home to where that VA medical hospital was. And of course, I'd never heard tell of it. I didn't even know it existed. And neither did any of the other veterans in our area. So today we have, just in my state alone of West Virginia, we have four huge VA medical centers to take care of veterans. And then a whole bunch of uh, 
satellite places out where they can go and receive medical care without having to go to a hospital. So the amount of service that's being furnished today compared to what we had is monumental. Absolutely. And a great, great thing. So we're definitely moving in the right direction. And I'm going to um, put a feather in your cap for you. One of those VA hospitals in West Virginia was just recently dedicated and named after you. Yes, it was. Yes. So yes, was. and good yeah. recognition of, of ongoing service to veterans. You know, that's one of the things that I see with most Medal of Honor recipients as well, is that not only did you serve at great sacrifice and potential sacrifice during your conflict, but you continued to serve afterwards, not just the as a whole, but specifically veterans. So thank you for that question. Do we have any more questions from Kane Lindsay specifically about um, going back to World War II for a bit before we go forward in, in life again? Okay. Here comes a young man. Thank you, sir. Um, while you were on the ship as a reserve, did you want to go ashore onto Iwo Jima? Well, yes, I, I guess I did here again. That was what we were there for. Uh, we were there to win the war. And the only way you can win the war is to overpower the other people. So we looked, we looked like or looked at it as a responsibility. And if whatever it takes to save our freedom and save our country, we're going to do that because those are the most precious things that we have other than life itself. So we had no question about whether or not we would go into combat. That's what we were trained for. That was the obligation we accepted and we were always ready. Thank you. Um, I would ask Kaylin to, to pull up a good question and good answer. I would ask you to pull up another uh, question related to World War II. And while somebody else is getting ready for that, I want to ask, did you have any idea in relationship to this young man's question? Did you have any idea when you were waiting on that ship to find out if you were going on, what would be in store for you when you landed? I had a little bit of an idea. Uh, every island that we took was a little bit different. They weren't all the same, didn't follow the same pattern each time. Uh, I don't think we had any doubt that we wouldn't be uh, uh, successful, that we would do what we were supposed to do. We had just the year before, or a few months before actually, taken the island of Guam back from the, uh, from the enemy, and that was a step in the direction of finally getting this thing over. So there was no question. So it, a good step in a much, much larger cir circumstance. Notice yes. students that he said in getting this thing over, that goes to the, the entire war in the Pacific, keeping in mind, of course, that at the same time, there was more of the war going on in Europe. I want to draw attention for just a minute to this map that's behind us here on the wall. This is a really special map. It is, um, as you'll see, Pacific and the far east. And right here, this dot in the, out here and completely surrounded by ocean is Iwo Jima. Guam is down here. So you can see where our troops were operating out here in the Pacific. Now, I want to draw attention to these dots because for those of you who are animal lovers and dog owners, these dots represent the first canine platoons that our armed services used. So the green dots are army platoons, dogs, dog platoons, and the red dots are Marine Corps dog platoons. So that is a, a map from World War II that features that. And this is where we're talking about right now. This it says Volcano Islands. That's where Iwo Jima was, out there in the middle of absolutely nowhere. So do we have another? question related to the war or to Woody's action from Keeneland. Good morning. Hi. Um, how did it feel when you um, saw the flag being raised? How did it feel when you saw the flag being raised? And now the question is, did you actually see the flag being raised? <laughs> no, I really didn't see the flag go up. Uh, my memory 
uh, tells me that the flag was already up, but the Marines around me, uh, and we're still in battle, they're still dropping mortars on us and artillery, and we're in battle. But the Marines around me began yelling and and firing their weapons into the air. Yikes. Huh? Yikes, that's dangerous. Well, it was, but it was also a celebration because Old Glory was flying up on Mount Suribachi, which meant we were we were winning because now our flag is flying over this island. And it was really Old Glory that brought Iwo Jima to the forefront because had every island that we took, we always put up a flag once we were in a position to do so because we're going to occupy that island and not we're going to be in control of it, so Old Glory is going to be flying every day. But on Iwo, the thing that made it so iconic was this is the first actual enemy territory that we were capturing. All the other islands that we had taken in the Pacific, and that was quite a number of them, belonged to some other country. The the Japanese had taken them and occupied them, but they didn't own the island. They were just occupants. Iwo was their island. It was part of their country. Glory went up on Suribachi on that island. That meant to us, and I think all of America, hey, we're winning this thing. We are going to achieve our goal of saving our freedom and our country. Great question. Thank you for bringing that up. And students, that gives you some things to think about in terms of how powerful that symbol is. And I love that you've got the flag hanging in the back of the classroom there uh, on clear display. Thank you for that. Uh, but how how inspiring that symbol right. was for the troops who were fighting so hard to maintain that foothold. Um, I mentioned earlier that the World War II Museum, who's letting us use all their equipment and from where we're broadcasting today, started as the National D-Day Museum. And everybody thinks of June 6, 1944, Normandy, France, when they hear D-Day Museum. But this museum covers the war from before it's we got into it, the United States got into it, on through post-war at this point. And they have... Um, a pavilion dedicated to both the road to Berlin and the road to Tokyo. And there is a map on display here that shows D-Day landings in the Pacific. And the first time I saw that map, I was struck by the fact you mentioned there were lots of little islands. So audience, when you hear lots, you might be thinking 15, 20, 50. When that map, it was an interactive map that when you pressed a button, it would light up the D-Days, the dedicated landing days in the Pacific, there were over 400 lights that popped up on that map of islands that we had landed on in the Pacific. So of those, aside from the fact that it was enemy territory that we showed that we were making progress, why else was Iwo Jima so important? Well, our B-29s, uh, huge aircraft that had uh, 11 or 12 highly skilled, trained Americans on it, were flying back and forth from the islands of Guam and Saipan all the way to Japan to drop bombs to try to influence them to surrender. So they were making trips back and forth constantly, and we couldn't send fighter planes with them to protect them because we, the fighter plane didn't have enough fuel to fly where they did. And some of them were injured by, you know, aircraft uh, fire or ACAC -ac guns, we called it. And, or they ran out of fuel and they had the ditch in the ocean and there was no way of rescuing them. So we lost them. So Iwo Jima was only 600 miles from Japan and once we got it, we could put fighter planes there and protect those B-29s flying back and forth. And it became a huge air base as a result of, of our taking it. 
and save thousands and thousands of lives. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good question to bring up and a good piece of history there. Um, I'd like to turn a little bit from just the pure history questions now to some of the questions that some students sent in uh, that have to do with one of the things that we deal with with the Medal of Honor Foundation representing the society, and that's the values embodied in the Medal of Honor. And one of those, of course, is courage, the other's commitment, integrity, sacrifice, of course, and citizenship and patriotism. And you've already touched on most of those in one way or another. But one student wrote in and asked, what gave you the strength to get through each day? Um, well, <laughs> you're going to think this is silly. But I was engaged to one of the most beautiful women in the world, as far as I was concerned. And my desire was to stay alive so I could come back to her. I wanted to marry that young lady. And it, it gave me uh, courage and a purpose. And I would never permit myself to think or let it go through my mind over and over that I'm going to make it. I, I did the opposite of that. I kept thinking, I'm going to do this. I'm going to survive. I am going to get home. And that gave me courage to do whatever I had to do. That was my goal. That's super. Greater, greater purpose. That's right. So now, so now we know some of your motivation to get home. And a related question that was also sent in before, before we started today said, um, why did you put others before yourself when you could have chosen to play it safe? I don't know if you actually had a choice, but the, your commanding officer said, do you think you could do something? And, um, oh, we got a quick question here. Did you marry that girl? I did. And we were married for 63 years and had two beautiful daughters. And now I got five grandsons and two great grandsons. I'm the happiest man in town. <laughs> that is that is wonderful. Um, but even though you had that as your as your goal to get home, you still took a job that was an incredibly you knew you had seen six people before you not make it out. And you were willing to accept that job. Um, that, that is a difficult question. It really is. Uh, here again, I, I guess I felt as a young, as a youth, that I owed something to my country. I had a teacher. Uh, her name was Naoma Morgan, Miss Naoma Morgan. She devoted her whole life to teaching. And she is the one that really taught me the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. My folks didn't do it, and probably your folks are not doing it either, because it's just something that families normally do not do. And But the other thing she taught me was how important it was to be proud that I was an American, that I lived in a free country, and that perhaps I owed something back in some way for the, all the privileges that others had given me. Because before I got here, and certainly before you got here, there have been those that have sacrificed their lives just so we could have all that, that we have today, the privileges and, and a free country and all the good things. So she taught me all of that, and that stuck with me. So I sort of felt an obligation that when somebody is trying to take something valuable away from you, you you've got to do something about that. And so I went, I went to war. As I said, I did not go to keep people. I didn't know I was going to have to do that. I didn't realize I was going to have to do that until I got in the Marine Corps. And those who had already been there were teaching us what it is going to be like once we get there, then I realized, well, in order for us to win, they cannot. Good, good lessons, good things for our students to hear. Thank you for that. Um, did you have any idea that your service could end up, man? Hmm with this. 
Absolutely did, not. Did you even know what it was? Never heard of it. No. The, the day I received it on the White House lawn, uh, presented to me by President Harry S. Truman, even though he put the ribbon around my neck and congratulated me and even made the statement to me, as he did to others, I would rather have this medal than to be president of the United States. That's the value that he placed on the medal. He being a World War I veteran himself. And so he knew the value and the, uh, the obligation that we were going to assume the minute we received that medal. But I had never heard tell of it. I didn't know what impact it was going to have on my life. It actually changed my life. I became a different person because when I received this medal, I didn't receive it just because of what I did. I received it because of what others had done. Others made it possible for me to receive the Medal of Honor. Had they not recommend, had my commanding officer not recommended it, had my fellow Marines had not been willing to substantiate what he said took place that particular day, I couldn't have received the Medal of Honor. So I have said ever since I realized the impact of it, the obligation that I had to assume the moment I received it, once I realized that, then its significance grew monumental, absolutely. And I have said many, many times in my life, I don't wear the medal for what I did. I was just doing that for which the Marine Corps trained me to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. But I wear it for those who never got to come home, those who sacrificed their lives so that I could come back home to a free country. I, I'm trusting here that most of our audience knows that the Medal of Honor is the only medal for which servicemen and women are put in for that medal by the people who were with them on the front lines in the in the action at the time as opposed to by a commanding officer sitting in the back somewhere so that's part of what differentiates it from the others and um let me mention there is one lady there is one lady with the medal of honor yes, yes. from from the civil war and that we have a lesson on that by the way in um, both the elementary and secondary kids so you teachers go out there and look that up and find out about dr mary walker that's right and um and more recently though because the medal was codified in during world war one as a, specifically a combat medal and because women were not allowed in combat that's why we have not had more women being awarded the medal but now that we allow women in combat that certainly that that could change it is Absolutely. definitely a, a combat medal so the, the Medal of Honor, you said, then changed your life because Absolutely. you had a little, you, the president met one day and you were impressed by that. But then the next day, I believe you had a chat with your more immediate boss, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, <laughs> Well, or he had yeah. a chat with you. Yeah, I think he had a chat with me. <laughs> Could you share that with us? <laughs> well, as a Marine enlisted person, I never dreamed that I would ever be in the presence of the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. It was just, he was on a pedestal that I didn't think I could ever even get close to. But uh, all of us Marines who received the medal the same day I did, uh, <clears throat> and there were actually 13 of us received the medal the same day. The uh, uh, Of the 13, there were uh, nine uh, Marines and the rest of them were Navy corpsmen that belonged or worked with the Marines as a medic and took care of us who were wounded and, and hurt. So all the Marines had to appear individually before the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I was literally frightened half to death because I just never thought I would be in the presence of that person. and. Much of what he said to me that day, I don't even remember. I was too scared, I think. 
<laughs> one of the things I do remember was that uh, he said that medal does not belong to you. It belongs to all those Marines who never got to come home. And don't ever do anything that would tarnish a word that has been lost to his history that would tarnish that medal, meaning disgrace it in some way, or have something uh, that would reflect badly upon it. I remember those words very, very well. Wow, sounds like it made a huge impression. It did. Yeah, definitely. I would like for us to take a couple more questions from Caneland, if we could. So somebody got a question ready for us there? Thank you for thank you for sharing that about the. And I think it's interesting that you didn't say anything about being scared when you were on Iwo Jima, but you sound like you were quivering in your boots when you were talking to the commandant of the Marine Corps. You're right. <laughs> Marine Corps thinking here. Yes, young lady, would you please share your question? You mentioned an obligation that comes with the medal. Can you tell us about some of those obligations? Oh. Question, obligations that come with the medal. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I, like all the others who have received the Medal of Honor, could not have received it unless an officer recommended it. I, an enlisted person in our military service cannot recommend someone for the Medal of Honor. It must come from an officer. And the second requirement is that there must be at least two witnesses that can confirm or verify what the commanding officer has written as his recommendation. So <clears throat> once you receive the medal, then, and most Medal of Honor recipients will, will tell you this, they don't wear it for themselves. They wear it for others, which means that you're taking on an obligation to pay tribute and high respect to the medal itself and to all of those who may be in possession of it. And not to do anything that would reflect badly upon that person or the medal itself. A related question here from, um, from a listener in California. What has been the most difficult part of wearing that medal? I think adjusting your life, because the, the minute you receive the medal, you become a public figure, whether you want to or not. You, you may not want to do that. And there are those who would not ever accept it. Yes. You, you know, you know some of those. Right. So, but the minute you receive the medal, you become a public figure. And that means that you're going to be called upon to do what we're doing here today. If you had asked me before I went to Marine Corps, I'd ever be sitting talking to a group of students, I would have said absolutely no. They know more than I do, so I'm not going to have anything to do with it. But really, not to mention that most people are more scared of public speaking than they are of death. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So that's an obligation that you assume or accept because you just because you received the medal. Well, the flip side of the difficulty of wearing that Medal of Honor, what, are, what have been some of the absolute highlights of wearing that Medal of Honor? Oh, the... the Privileges that have come to me as a result of having the medal are so numerous it would I could take up the rest of your time telling you. But one of the things that sticks in my mind and comes there first is from uh, the time that Kennedy, President Kennedy, was in office, we Medal of Honor recipients were invited to come to the inaugural in Washington, D.C., which happens every four years. And it's something that takes place in America that does not take place any place else in the world. It is unique and different. So we're invited to attend those inaugurals. I have had every member of my family 
to be able to attend those inaugurals over the years, and we've never missed one. Well, without having received the Medal of Honor, that invitation would have never been there, and certainly I as an individual, not having any power or position of any kind, I could have never arranged for that. The, the other thing, of course, is there are things in my state that carry my name on them. Like a, uh, what used to be National Guard Armory now is a Armed Forces Training Center, meaning that all branches of service use this training center to train their people. That has my name on it. That could have never happened without the Medal of Honor. In fact, I hear you have a boat. <laughs> yeah, I have a, it's, a, it's <laughs> kind of a little boat. It only weighs 90,000 tons. It's only 825 feet long. And uh, it carries a whole bunch of helicopters, uh, you know, Osprey and Blackhawks and all those helicopters. It's just a little teeny thing. Uh huh. And it's called the USS? No, it's, it's, it's not yet. Not yet. In May of next year, it will become a USS ship. There's a difference between the USS ship and a regular Navy ship. Uh, right now, it's considered a Navy ship because it's not a ship of war. It's not doesn't have armor on it. Okay. So it could be a, a warship. But once it becomes a USS ship, then it will be a warship and could participate in war. Okay, well, congratulations on that recognition. Thank that was you. that was pretty well, exciting. I, I I would correct the lady. <laughs> Ever? No, I needed that information. You you educated me. You didn't I don't feel corrected. I, feel I, I would su I would suggest a change in language. <laughs> okay, That's not good. a correction. That's a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, the VA Medical Center in my hometown just recently it was voted by the Congress to put my name on that medical center. Well, what an honor. I never dreamed anything in my life could possibly happen like that. And <clears throat> very often people will say, as she did, it is named after me. No, it's named for me because I'm still here. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. And we hope you're going to stick around a lot longer. And one of the things that I want to point out, I'm going to change direction a little bit here. Um, I mentioned earlier that you have lived a, a full life of service in addition to service with veterans and your service directly to this country as a Marine. Um, also as service to the Medal of Honor Society as their chaplain and um, the terrific grand father and, and uh, great grandfather that you are and father, um, all kinds of life of service, but you in these last few years have taken up yet another service. And I wanna give students a little background that you may not know about. Something I learned just in the last uh, few days is that before you went into the service, you delivered telegrams yes. at the start of World War II. And yes. those telegrams included notices of families wounded and killed in action. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I, I wanted to go in the Marine Corps, here again, to save my country and my freedom. And I'd already enlisted, but there were so many folk, many young people wanting to get in the war. Because we've got to win this thing, or we're going to lose everything. So they were coming in so rapidly that the armed forces couldn't find enough training people, people to train them. So uh, we had a waiting period. And uh, I had to wait a little better than two months before they could actually accept me and five other guys that were going into the Marine Corps from my area. <clears throat> and during that period of time, I'd already quit my previous job. Uh, I got a job driving a taxi cab. And I was working from six in the evening till six in the morning, a 12 hour shift every night. And uh, at that time, the notice of someone being killed in the armed forces was, was uh, notified by the delivery of a telegram to the family. That's the way we did it in World War I. We continued to do it in World War II. Mm -hmm. And 
those telegrams would uh, come into the Western Union office or the message would and they'd fix up a telegram. Then they would call a cab company because the Western Union office didn't have any cars or people. They'd call the cab company and say, we have a telegram to be delivered to such and such address. So we cab drivers were the people who were delivering those messages. And the people in the community, once they saw the envelope, which was different color than any other envelope, they already knew. Once that they saw that envelope, they knew it was bad news. Somebody in the family had been killed. I delivered some of those. And as a, I was 19 years old at the time. And it was very traumatic because as a 19 year old boy, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to talk to people or assist them in their grief or in the traumatic experience that they just had. So it left a lasting impression on me. And from that, I think over the years, uh, influenced my thinking to get into the program that we are in now. So uh, to connect students and give students a little more idea about this, probably many of you have seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. And if you haven't, you should. But there is a scene in that movie where from the camera angle, the audience is looking out through a screen door of a, like a screened in porch out onto the steps down to a sidewalk. And that scene took me right back. That was exactly what my grandma's house looked like. And my grandma had all three sons in World War II. And as I was watching that movie, the young man came up the sidewalk and turned, holding that Western Union telegram and walked up to the front door. And I thought at that moment, my gosh, my, my grandmother lived that because she lost one of her sons at the D-Day invasion. And I want to make that connection so that you can see that and see the intensity of that moment. And then think about what Woody is doing now. He has started a Gold Star Families Recognition Program. And I would like you to tell them okay. a little bit about that. Well, let's go way back to World War I. In World War I, mamas, mothers of those who were lost, who lost a son in World War I, they decided they wanted something to show that they had lost a loved one and they developed what is known as the gold star flag. And if a home lost a loved one, they'd put this in the window or on the front door so that people in the community would know that this home lost somebody in war. And that was done all during World War One. After World War One, we didn't use it anymore. Uh, those that uh, were lost during the period between World War I and World War II, and we had some, uh, the star, uh, gold star flag wasn't used because they were not killed in war. Then when World War II came along, the gold star flag came back into play again because we were losing not only sons, but fathers and brothers, and you know. So, the uh, gold star flag became prominent again but along with that somebody came up with the idea well that's good that's what we should do but we should also let people know that we have some serving in the war that's protecting our freedom and so the blue star flag was developed and these hung in the window of those who had somebody serving in the armed forces any branch my mother had three of these hanging in her front window. Those two of us, or two of my brothers were in Europe and I was in the Pacific. So they hung there all during the time we were gone. And fortunately, we all got home. But a child boyhood friend that uh, he and I were going to school together for about seven years, uh, his family had two of these blue stars in her window. But Leonard, my buddy, he didn't get home. So they had to change the blue to the gold because they lost a son. And from that, there was never any recognition in the country of those families that made that sacrifice. 
Gold Star Mothers are pretty well recognized around over the country. The name itself is pretty well recognized. But probably the most of us have never even heard the term Gold Star Dad. For whatever reason, we didn't use that, the, that term. And finally, it certainly got on me. Uh, a dad came to me and said he had just lost a son in Afghanistan. And he said, you know, dads cry also. And from that, we began working on trying to get some sort of a memorial that would honor the families that sacrificed for us. And we started a program to do that very thing. And I'm very proud to say that in our little state of West Virginia, we had the first one ever done in the United States. And from that, we have five in various communities around over the state. Six is in the process. And we'll finally get one on the Capitol grounds. And we just dedicated one here on the uh, Capitol grounds at Baton Rouge, the first one on Capitol grounds. So it, we have about 42 of these throughout the country someplace, various states, 36 states involved so far. But every state had these who have lost a loved one. Let me ask the question of the students here. Did any of you, or do you know, of any relative of any degree, regardless of the relationship, that somewhere in the background of your family, your relations, that somebody went to war or went to the military and never got home? How many? Is there any in this group? There are. There are. Yeah, uh, quite a few. Quite a it's few. Like a, we find these there. in every group. And they've never been recognized in any way. So this is to honor them for their sacrifice because they lost, they gave up more than we did. And you can go online and look for the Hershey, uh, the Herschel Woody Williams Foundation, and you'll be able to see the monuments and read about them. There's news coverage from Sunday when they dedicated the monument here in Louisiana, and you can see if there's already one in your state. Um, we This hour has flown by. We're only getting started. Is it 95 years? It hasn't been in an hour. <laughs> um, before we sign off, I know we have a message waiting for the, from the class from Caneland and probably from everybody on the side as well. Do you want to say something? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. It has been wonderful having everybody on here today. I apologize that we didn't get to more questions. There are lots of great questions. An hour is just too short. Maybe we'll do another one of these sometime. Okay, I'll be happy to, to do, do that. that. Yes. Um, so thanks all of you for your time and, and all that you do for us. We have some information slides up here at the end for, um, for teachers. To get your CE certificate for this webinar, it will be mailed automatically if you were here, for, emailed automatically if you were here for the entire program. Um, if you log on afterwards, you need to take the CE quiz, and all the information is there on edweb.net. We want to thank Edweb for doing that. We really want to give a big shout out to the World War II Museum once more for letting us broadcast from here, their home. It's great. You can also go on the Medal of Honor Foundation website, www.themedalofhonor.com, to request more information about the character development program and also to um, go back and review this webinar live and sign up for the next one. We have another one in a month. We will be interviewing Medal of Honor recipient Robert Mojeski, Vietnam Medal of Honor recipient on Thursday, November 15th. And we will be doing that from, we'll actually be broadcasting from a classroom in Southern California. So thank you all for your time. Woody, thank you so much. Happy birthday. Uh, let's you. do it again on 100. Thank you. I'm <laughs> willing. Okay, super. Thanks all. Good.